Bismillah, alhamdulillah, you're watching the beauties of Islam. I'm Yusuf Estes. We'd like now to get right into our episode this week. We've been talking about something called shirk, which is to associate partners with Almighty God in worship. I always receive a lot of email about this subject from our brothers in humanity, the Christians, when they say that, wait a minute, we believe a lot of the things that you guys are saying, but there's one thing we have a problem with, and that's what is the status of Jesus? And why can't we get through to God through Jesus? Didn't Jesus say that there's no way to the Father except by me? And didn't it say in the Bible that whoever doesn't believe as Jesus as the Christ, then he will never enter paradise? Well, in the English translation of some old manuscripts from translations of other languages, it says something like that, but even that's not exact. You can look in the book of John, and you will find the reference to the last one I talked about, that you must believe in Jesus as the Christ to enter paradise. But here's the thing about that. What does that mean to you? If you think that Jesus being the Christ means he's also God, and that's the way to God, then this is really a strange thing to come up with. Because basically, you've missed the point of what the Christ really is. The word itself is a Kone Greek word. It's not Hebrew, and it's not Aramaic. It's not the language of Jesus. It's a translation. It comes from the word in Greek, Christos. And Christos is a translation of the word that was being said, literally, in the Old Testament, Messihi, which we, as English speakers, usually mispronounce, and we say Messiah. But in fact, it is Messihi. And you can find that in Hebrew in the dictionary. You can find it in Arabic in the dictionary, same word. And Messihi means the one who was chosen. He's the chosen one, chosen by God. But the word itself means that this is a process or a procedure that was done whenever the children of Israel would appoint a king. When they appointed a king to let everybody know this is our king, they would assemble everybody together for what was called the Grand Assembly. They brought everybody together. And then there, in front of all these people, they would do this ceremony where they would take a vessel full of zaytun oil, okay, that's olive oil, put the fingers in there, the high priest would put his fingers into the olive oil, and then he would anoint the head of the new king. And by putting that olive oil, wiping this like that, they would say that he is now what? The one who has had mess on his head. This mess, not mess, like messy, okay? But it means to wipe something. This act that I'm doing here, this is called mess, to wipe. And this is what they did. And that's why it says Messiah. So if you believe that Jesus is the one who is appointed, anointed, to be the king of the children of Israel, then you have believed in the Quran, because that's exactly what the Quran tells us. We have no problem with that. We understand that. It says in the Quran that he is the Messihi, Isa ibn Maryam. He is the Messiah, the Christ, the son of Mary. So we have no problem with this because, in fact, it's our belief, without a doubt. But to claim that that makes him God or a partner with a God or a son of a God is a very strange thing. And there's no evidence not from the text, and really not from common sense either. Especially when you consider this. I want to refer to another verse. When Jesus is talking to the people in the older manuscripts, you can find this. He's saying, and you might find reference to it in some of the translations today in English, in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 17, something like this, where he says, don't think I came to destroy the Torah. It's sometimes translated as law, capital L-A-W. I came not to destroy the Torah or the law, but rather 
uh, and the prophets. He didn't destroy their teachings of the prophets, but rather I came to fulfill. And not until all things are accomplished shall a single dot, jot, iota, tittle, and be in any wise lessened from the law. I use those words because it depends on which translation you have is what you're going to find. But a dot or a tittle or an iota, these were the smallest letters or the smallest markings. An iota is like the smallest letter in the Kone Greek alphabet. So if you had, for instance, the Hebrew, now today they have Mesrati text, and if you found the letter Sheen, you'll find it has a dot over it. If you find the letter Sin, it has a dot on the opposite side. And the, in the Arabic language, if you look, you'll find the letter called Sin. It looks kind of like a W with a big tail. And then if it has no dots, this is Sin. But if it has three dots over it, that's Sheen. And if you said, well, what's that got to do with our subject? Well, those dots are exactly what we're talking about. None of it's going to change from God's law. What came with these scriptures, what came with these prophets, is not to be changed by anybody. And whoever, I'm going to go back to the verses now, and whoever breaks the least of the commandments of God and teaches this, he will be the least in the kingdom. But whosoever keeps these commandments and teaches this, he'll be the highest in the kingdom. And unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, the Pharisees were the leaders of the Sanhedrin or the temple of the time, unless your righteousness is more than theirs, you won't even go to paradise. Now that's a lot that I gave you right there and I'm going to come back right after the break now and I want to show you how this compares to what we understand from the Quran and the teachings of Muhammad. So sit right there for more Beauties of Islam. Well, we're back with more Beauties of Islam. If you missed the first part of it, just in summary, what we were talking about is some verses that we had found in the Bible talking about the law or Torah is forever going to be in effect. The commandments of the Torah are going to be forever in effect. This is according to the New Testament, claiming that the Old Testament is still in effect. I'm using that because of the basis of what I'm going to tell you next. There are those who say that the New Testament makes claims that are not in the Old Testament. If that's true, then whoever is saying this is negating a statement in the New Testament itself. And whoever says God has a son, our subject, by the way, is not worshiping Jesus, but worshiping the one that Jesus worshipped. That's what we're basically trying to get across in this episode. But whoever says God has got a son and need to worship his son has got a serious problem because if you go back and look in the Old Testament, in the part that's attributed to Moses, you'll find one of those five books called Numbers because they used to number the people for census. And in the book of Numbers, chapter 23, verse 19, it states clearly, God is not a man that he should sin. And God is not the son of man that he should repent. Now, somebody might say, well, that doesn't prove Jesus isn't God. <laughs> okay. Let's consider this. If Jesus is God, or if he was God, or part of God, then here's a question for you. Why would he pray to God? In the prayer that he taught, his followers... He told them to pray directly to the one above and to even ask for God's will to be done. He didn't say ask for the will of the Trinity. He didn't say ask for the will of Jesus. He said ask for the will of the one above, the almighty God. Ask for his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Then in Gethsemane, and this is mentioned in all the Gospels, in Gethsemane, we have Jesus who is praying there and he's seeking 
from Allah, from Almighty God, he wants him, God, to excuse him and let him off the hook here. He's saying, let this cup pass from me. And this is uh, something that people used to pass their cup and take a drink and pass it to the next one. And when it says pass by, means that I don't want to participate. I don't want to take a drink. So when he says, let this cup pass from me, essentially he's saying, I don't want this to happen to me, but even so, your will be done. Now, this statement it becomes really clear. He's praying, he's asking, and he's talking to God and saying, your will is the ultimate will. Even so, whatever you want, this is what I want. This indicates clearly Jesus is not equal to God. That's a positive statement there, and you, you can't twist the text on that to come up with anything else. He's not God. He's praying to God. And he doesn't even know what's the outcome. Otherwise, he wouldn't be there crying and praying and asking him. Now, these teachings are the same teachings that we have in Islam. Because we definitely believe in all of the prophets, as we've been talking in the beauties of Islam. We believe in all these prophets. Some you maybe even never heard of before. We believe in all of the books that came with all the prophets. We believe in the message that they came with being the one and same message that came with the first prophet, which is Adam, and continued all the way to Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon all the prophets. The message is this. Worship God without partners. Believe there's only one God and then give yourself over to Him. Totally. And this is the way to get to God. Bypass the middleman. Don't worship something that you can see, hear, smell, taste, feel, imagine in your mind. Because if it's this, then it's in the creation. It's not the creator. And therefore, it's not worthy of your worship. Make sense? So the first commandment we find in the Old Testament is very clear. In the book of Exodus, chapter 20, we find God telling them, and this is English translation of the manuscripts, but basically, listen to the teaching here. I'm the Lord your God that brought you out of the land of Egypt and the house of bondage. And beside me, there's no other God. Thou shalt not have any other gods beside me. This is the teaching from the Old Testament. The New Testament, we've already talked about in Mark 12, 29. Say, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. One Lord. And worship him with all your heart, mind and strength. And in Islam, la ilaha illallah. There's none to worship except Allah. And this is one of the biggest beauties of Islam. Till next time, peace. Peace be upon you. Assalamu alaikum.